June the 19th, 1999, the day the Queen's youngest son, Prince Edward, gets married and Sophie Rhys-Jones becomes the last British royal princess of the millennium. standard flying on top of the round tower of Windsor Castle on an overcast but dry day. 550 invited guests and 6,000 ordinary members of the public are gathering here in Windsor Castle for the wedding of His Royal Highness the Prince Edward and Miss Sophie Rhys-Jones. Good afternoon and welcome to Windsor. Well, it was just before lunchtime that the palace announced that Prince Edward was to be made Earl of Wessex, a title last held by King Harold, who was killed by an arrow at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. Not the best precedent, you might think. He'll also be Viscount Seven and will become the Duke of Edinburgh when the Queen and the present Duke die. Meantime, Sophie will be known as Her Royal Highness the Countess of Wessex. It's really interesting that they've made it known that they don't want any children of this marriage here today to be royal highnesses, which is in line with the policy of making the royal family that much smaller. It's been a long courtship, and when Edward finally proposed just before Christmas, they both said pretty firmly that they didn't want the pomp and pageantry of the recent royal weddings. They chose St George's Chapel here at Windsor, not Westminster Abbey or St Paul's. They wanted a quiet family affair, no cameras. But the public interest was much too great for that. They relented and invited BBC cameras to film the event for an estimated 200 million people around the world. Of course, without Sue Barker here, all this would never have happened. Just think, Sue, if you hadn't have stood him up that Steady. day. Steady. No, 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 no. More on that later. The two of us will try to guide you through live coverage of an unusual royal occasion the highlight of the royal year. Yes, hello. Six years on from their first meeting, here we are for their big day. Let me tell you a bit about the plans for this afternoon. In a few moments, we'll be profiling the couple. And we'll be watching the arrival of the guests, including some well-known faces. We'll be looking at the fashion statements being made as the ladies wear evening dress for this wedding. Fiona Bruce will be reporting on St George's Chapel, steeped in history, but hosting only its third royal wedding this century. We'll be out on the streets of Windsor as the crowds wait for their first sight of the bride. And we'll be speculating on the bride's wedding dress. All that coming up, but first, what about the couple themselves? They're working people. Edward's tried hard to build a life beyond the royal family. He has his own television production company. Sophie has a public relations business. They both say that they want to go on working and lead as normal a life as possible. January this year, and two happy 30-somethings have an important announcement to make. I don't think Sophie would have said yes if I'd said before, and hopefully by the fact she did say yes, I must have got the timing right, so... Uh... <laughs> I'm fully aware of, of the responsibilities and the commitment, and, uh, and, and I think now I am ready. Ready for a very different kind of life. While Edward was born into it all, Sophie's first family home was rather more modest, a cottage near Oxford. And while Edward was already experiencing the privileges of a royal upbringing, Hi. Sophie's childhood was rather more conventional. The family moved to the Kent village of Brenchley. There, life for Sophie and older brother David was ordinary rather than grand, middle class rather than rich. Her father Christopher worked in the motor trade. Her mother Mary was a secretary. Sophie went to private school, but as a day pupil, not a boarder. A popular girl, not particularly distinguished at anything, but a good team player, especially at sport. 
Edward's school days were different. He went to Gordonston, the rather eccentric Scottish boarding school favoured by the royal family. He got three A-levels, but his first love was entertaining. The best fun ever was working with a group of other people on stage. Life is one big act for me, um, and I'm sure for a lot of other people. Before Cambridge, he went to New Zealand to teach and was there to welcome his older brother, Prince Charles, on honeymoon with his new wife. With eight O-levels and two A-levels, Sophie headed for London and an industry very much of its time, public relations. Her big break came with a job in the promotions department at Capital Radio, a big step up for a 22-year-old from Kent. After four years at Capital, she took a year off, heading first to Switzerland and a job in a ski resort, and then to Australia, where she went backpacking before resuming her career. As things were going right for Sophie, Edward was having an uncomfortable time in the Royal Marines. He left after four months to try television. I still find it hard to hit one of my ancestors. First a documentary, then it's a royal knockout, then a phone-in. How do you feel about your brothers and sisters being married? <laughs> Why, because I'm the only one left, you mean? Yes. <laughs> I don't think you're in any hurry, though. No, I'm, 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 absolutely, I'm in no hurry at all, no. Neither was Sophie. Back in London, her PR talents were very much in demand. Edward was in the West End, too, working for Andrew Lloyd Webber. They could have met through work, but it was Edward's royal duties in 1993, a challenge game of real tennis promoting the Duke of Edinburgh's award that brought them together. Sophie's boss was in charge of the PR, and he needed a pretty girl for the photo call. It wasn't love at first sight. Edward took two months to ask for a date, but soon they were being besieged. Edward was used to it, Sophie clearly not. Everybody was expecting a quick wedding, but despite Sophie becoming a regular royal guest, it didn't happen. They focused on their careers. Two years ago, Sophie set up her own PR company with clients certainly not put off by her royal connection. Um, what we're going to do is, Philip's going to blow candles out in a minute. And if I could just ask you to say uh, a few words basically to launch the appeal. Edward combined royal obligations with his own company, producing and presenting TV programmes, some close to home. Westminster Abbey and the Palace of Westminster provide the backdrops and settings to some of the greatest state occasions and royal pageantry in our nation's life. Throughout the five years they've been together, it's been a very private relationship. Sophie always a few steps behind Edward in public, but increasingly part of his life. We share a number of interests. We laugh a lot. We have a great friendship. Yeah. <laughs> so you were uh, there when they met, or rather, actually, the point was you weren't there when they met. Well, I sort of was. <laughs> I, I played real tennis with uh, Prince Edward, and then we did an interview, and, and, and we had to do some advertising, and, and the company I was working for wouldn't let me do it. So they had to find a late rep replacement, and Sophie sort of stepped into the breach, and she was absolutely terrified to do so. But you could tell that they really got on right from the first You've moment. seen quite a bit of them since, haven't you? So, mm. I mean, one of the reasons that they wanted a quieter wedding was those grand marriages of the Queen's other children did end rather disastrous and they didn't want any echoes of that. Did you get that impression when you were talking to them? Well, I asked them about it and Edward said that uh, it wasn't an issue because anybody that decides to get married does it for, you know, for the best intentions. But to being a royal wedding, he said, we're doing it for ourselves. We've decided we want to do it for ourselves and make it work. And as for Sophie, she said that she's fully aware of the family that Edward uh, comes from and she's uh, prepared for the requirements, the commitments of being a royal bride. But of course they are uh, different because both of them are going to be working and they've said that will be their priority but uh, after six years I think Sophie is ready she's well prepared <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's really filling up out, the, out here isn't it and getting rather and getting rather windy yes so. it is it is difficult we've been watching many of the guests arriving including some uh, well-known faces including Lord Lloyd Webber who was a uh, Edward's first boss at the uh, really useful theatre company when he was a production yeah. assistant there they are queuing up to the west door of uh, St George's Chapel with some really interesting uh, choices of uh, dresses from the women. Some of them really, really pretty colourful. Well, of course, that really has been a difficult decision, really, what to wear. Because uh, the invitation said uh, no hats or anything. But of We've course, seen a couple of hats. Though. We've seen a couple, and I think we might see a couple more. But of course, it's been an unusual timing of this wedding. Early evening rather than the more traditional daytime. It's raised some uh, interesting etiquette and fashion questions for the guests. 
550 men and women, all invited guests and all faced with sartorial decisions. Among them, Tanya Rose, a successful sales and marketing consultant. She has known Prince Edward since she was 14 when they were both at Gordonston and has remained a close friend. This is the um, information sheet that was actually sent when we received the invitation and it had got a whole section on dress. It says, gentlemen morning dress, well that's easy for them. Ladies evening dress, no hats. Suggest three quarter or full length dresses but no ball gowns. So I was a little bit worried about that because I thought what does no ball gowns mean? And I spoke to Sophie and she said basically it means no off the, off the shoulder dresses because you're in a church and obviously it's not respectful to, to have bare shoulders. But for those who haven't a direct line to Sophie, there are alternatives. The Honourable Camilla Cecil is social editor of Harper's and Queen. I have had quite a lot of calls at Harper's from people who are slightly worried about what to wear. There are certain problems, but thankfully this year there are an awful lot of those wonderfully coloured pashminas around that look so elegant, so they can be swirled around the shoulders and maybe people will wear capes. And as to hats, just because you're not wearing a hat doesn't mean to say you don't have to put anything in your hair. You can wear those wonderfully feathered headdresses and the butterfly clips with the, the wonderfully glittery clips to do up your hair. So, yes, there have been problems, but I think people will sort them out and they all look incredibly elegant. Elegant, but it's basic black for the men, according to Jeeves and Hawkes design director James Wishaw. The advice we've given to our customers who are attending the wedding is obviously not to wear your ascot grey tailcoat uh, to morning dress wedding events because that is a major faux pas. Uh, most of the guests of the wedding will actually be wearing a black tailcoat, a single-breasted or double-breasted grey waistcoat and a silk tie with a grey striped trouser. So while it's traditional Savile Row for the men, the women are looking to top designers to create outfits that offer both decoration and decorum. I went to Bruce Oldfield and I found this wonderful dress which as you can see, is very glamorous, good colouring for me, and it's got this great jacket so that when you're in the church, obviously your shoulders are covered up. Um, the split up the front also matches the, the reverse side of the jacket, and then when you do take the jacket off, it's got a very, very nice body, which is covered in sequins, so when you're dancing, it's not very hot. So, good jacket for the church, and then a lovely dancing dress as well. I've been looking out for her, but I haven't seen her yet. <laughs> the service itself is being held in St George's Chapel, one of England's finest examples of late medieval architecture and a monument to history, chivalry and the monarchs who made both. Even the buildings in front of the main entrance that make up the so-called horseshoe cloister absolutely reek of history. In the Vicar's Hall on the first floor, just to the left, Shakespeare staged his play The Merry Wives of Windsor for the first time in front of Queen Elizabeth I, Shades of Shakespeare in Love. Sophie Rees-Jones is more likely to be nervous than Mary in the last moments before she becomes a wife. What will she see when she arrives? Fiona Bruce looks at the chapel for us. When Sophie arrives here at the West Steps, this is when we'll first get what we've all been waiting for, a look at her dress. And unlike other royal weddings, there won't be a military line-up here to welcome her, though the red carpet will be rolled out. The royal couple wanted to keep things simple, but obviously this is no ordinary wedding. When Sophie walks in, she'll be walking into one of the great chapels of England. The Gothic columns soaring above her as if to heaven. To her left, she'll glimpse the tomb of Edward's great-grandparents, George V and Queen Mary. Looking down from beneath the high windows, a heavenly choir of medieval carved stone angels guide her path down the nave. To the music of the March era week, she'll meet Prince Edward for the first time beneath the organ screen, where the first part of the ceremony will take place. Then they'll walk through the choir, past members of the royal family and Sophie's family beneath the banners of the Garter Knights and on towards the High Altar, built as a memorial to Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, and first seen at the wedding of their son, another Edward, the scene portrayed by the artist William Frith in 1863. 
Queen Victoria was too grief-stricken at the death of her husband to join the wedding party and watched alone from the Edward IV Chantry. Today's scene will be captured by royal portrait painter Richard Stone. I'm looking for a gesture, a little episode in it that can add um, a good storyline to it, that it sort of captures something of the excitement of the event, the glamour of the event, if you want. I mean, the setting is so marvellous, as was beautifully depicted in William Frith's earlier picture. Um, this is hopefully going to be a companion piece to that. So I'll be looking to the architecture to sort of frame it. There are the glorious banners of the Garter Knights and um, the, the beautiful quality of light in the chapel is something that I hope to, to get. And of course, all the, all the significant figures will have to be immediately recognizable. It's wonderfully exciting. Richard Stone arrived at the chapel early today to start his preliminary sketches. He's been a royal portrait painter for 25 years. He first painted the Queen Mother. The finished painting should measure 10 foot by 8, and he plans to take about a year to complete it. Now this is the first time we've had a look at the altar, and it's beautifully decorated with flowers. Well, behind us here, still uh, more guests are arriving. And of course, all eyes this afternoon will be on Sophie, who throughout the day has been preparing at the Royal Lodge. But it's not just the dress that will be under scrutiny. These are the people behind the public face of Sophie Rees-Jones today. Her hairdresser, Andrew Collinge, and makeup artist, Cheryl Phelps Gardner. She first met Sophie at the photo session for these commemorative stamps. A few days later, a call came. She was so sweet when she rang up because she asked me if I knew anybody who would like to do her makeup or if it was my kind of thing, you know. And I said, Sophie, I'd be so delighted to do it. I was hoping you'd ask me. So I was really thrilled. Cheryl has painted the faces of Kiri de Canoa, Cindy Crawford, and Helen Mirren. She really is a natural lady. You know, she's got lovely skin, lovely glowing skin, and her eyes are all sparkly. Um, and she just likes to look natural and like herself. We're going to keep Sophie looking like she has been looking. You know, kind of like um, the man's been going out with his fiancée for five years and loves her looking nice and fresh, and then he turns around and sees his poodle walking up the aisle. We're not going to do any of that. Sophie's going to look like Sophie. Cheryl has already been to Buckingham Palace for a practice session. This is what they've decided upon. Without giving too much away, we're kind of... That'll be the depth of colour, and we're talking around the eyes, and sort of round about there-ish. Just a nice, soft, pretty, pretty browns. Oh, and lipstick. Kind of a natural pretty pink, but it may not be this colour. And then again, it may be. <laughs> This has been the other man in Sophie rees Jones' life for the past five years, and he has helped transform her. Andrew Collinge has taken her from this to this. The very first time I met Sophie, her hair was in more of a bob style. And because her hair's quite fine, we felt it should maybe stay shorter. So we actually cut it shorter into the nape, very much the style she wears now, and she just tucks it behind. She also has it coloured, puts very fine highlights in it, which gives her hair volume as well. As with all brides, you shouldn't cut the hair too near the wedding day. So it was about two weeks ago I last cut Sophie's hair, and so the style sort of softens in to shape for the big day. Her hair is actually going to complement the dress. Her hair has to complement the dress, but I don't think you're going to see any big changes with her hair. It'll just really be very simple, very stylish, and it'll suit her perfectly, I hope, for the day. The bridal party are preparing at a house lent to Sophie by the Queen Mother. Is that okay, please? We'll be at the lodge in Windsor Park, and we'll be looking after Sophie, her mum, some members of the family, and uh, the little bridesmaids as well. So I think it'll be quite busy. I know I'm going to be doing some of the bridesmaids as well, but Sophie's mum too. We've already talked about waterproof mascara, because she says she's maybe crying a little. But I think I'll be the one that starts everybody off anyhow. <laughs> 
what you have to know is that Sue has had hair, her hair done by Andrew <laughs> College in the castle early this morning. Do you let out any secrets under the curlers? Sir? Well, no, not really. I mean, he did actually say that on the, the film there that he had cu it, cut he, Sophie's hair yeah. two weeks ago and he just phoned her up and said, do you want to come back and just have your fringe done? And she was so relaxed. She said, no, no, just do it on the day. And he's like, I don't want to do it on the day. I don't want to do it on the day. But he's going to have a very busy day. Anyway, we found out about uh, the hair and makeup for Sophie today. Now, what about the wedding dress? A typical Samantha Shaw wedding dress is romantic and modern. And it manages to be conventional in one respect, but unconventional in another, very often through the choice of fabric. Um, Samantha Shaw's own wedding dress, for example, was made of an amazing silk gabardine, which is not the sort of fabric that you normally expect to find for a wedding dress. She picks up on what people's features are and really emphasizes them and hides areas that, other, that people aren't comfortable with. Sophie's style is very modern, very intelligent, very independent. And um, she very much is mistress of her own wardrobe. She wears the clothes. She doesn't let the clothes take over. She's so natural and, and down to earth and, you know, in her little basement flat, you didn't feel at all overwhelmed by the grandness of fashion and, you know, immediately just put you at ease. And I thought, great, this is going to be easy. All right. Samantha's brilliant and she's got a reputation for being um, incredibly discreet, um, which I'm sure was what Sophie wanted. She does wedding dresses brilliantly and, you know, she's just got such fantastic attention to detail and she knows what she's doing. This is the actual... And now you can see the chapel almost full with guests here. The people that you can see sitting here in front of the organ screen, these are mainly uh, friends. Ah, you can see David Frost there with his wife, just to the right there, Karina Frost. They were at uh, the wedding of Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson, old friends of the royal family. And that's a familiar face. We've already had that pointed out to us, Andrew Lloyd Webber and his wife. Of course, Prince, and Prince Edward worked for Andrew Lloyd Webber in the really useful theatre company. That was his first job, the first time a royal prince had a job, had a career. Now the lady you can see there with the long blonde hair, that's Katrina Skeppel. She used to be a model, famously known as a former flake girl. And she now works for, for the BBC actually. And as you've already heard, the dress code is evening dress and no hats. Well, that's quite a hat here. I'm joined here by the Trini Woodall, who's the weekend fashion editor of the Daily Telegraph. Trini, what do you make of that hat? I think it's something where you just want to show that you're an individual and you want to make yourself feel quite glamorous, and it certainly does it. You stand out, don't you, with something like that? Well, I've never seen anything like <laughs> it.
obviously consulting her order of service there. The chapel is nearly full now. And what you can see here in the choir, this is where the royal family will be sitting and members of uh, the foreign royal family and the members of Sophie's family. All the banners you can see there are the, the banners of the Knights of the Garter. Archbishop of Canterbury there, George Carey. He's an onlooker today, of course. Uh, the former Archbishop of Canterbury performed the ceremonies for Charles and Diana and for Andrew and Sarah. Today he's just going to be watching the proceedings. Now, defying the dress code, the Mrs. Margaret Rhodes, who's cousin to the Queen, she's a lady in waiting to the Queen Mother. Trini, she's also made a bit of a bold decision to wear a hat, as has the lady next to her. I think it's great, and I think especially for ladies of this age, it's much easier for them to know what to wear because they can look classically elegant in things they will wear, maybe to a wedding during the day, because she's going to obviously cover her knees. And she looks fantastic. And the lady next door to her too has a hat on. And that's Sophie Rhys Jones's brother there, David, who will read the lesson. And you get a fantastic view of the chapel there, built by King Edward IV in 1475. It's one of the best examples you'll find of that kind of vaulting. Familiar face there, Anthony Andrews and his wife. He was also present at the wedding of Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson. Tiggy Leg Burke there, nanny to the Princes William and Harry. Well, Sophie and her family have been staying actually in Windsor Great Park in the Royal Lodge, which is uh, uh, the weekend home uh, of the Queen Mother. It's very secluded. It, it lies in 33 acres of woodland. And it was there that King Edward VIII had his last meal with the royal family, including the Queen Mother, the night before his abdication and before sailing in a Navy warship into exile. The statue, incidentally, is of George III, Mad King George, he was called, who used to talk to trees hereabouts. The sculptor was very, very proud of this, uh, of this particular statue until people pointed out that he'd forgotten the stirrups. He'd forgotten the stirrups. <laughs> he really took this terribly badly, so badly, in fact, that he um, committed suicide. Oh, that's a happy story. Well, <laughs> work, working with royalty could be very, <laughs> very dangerous. <laughs> no, it's interesting. We've been just sitting here watching so many of the, the buses arrive, haven't we? And the cheers, because everyone wants to see them walking through, don't they? All the guests, that uh, there they are. They've been sitting there for so many hours, and the minibuses that have been... It's a sort of a park-and-ride system for the guests <laughs> arriving here, because they have to park their cars in a specially created car park uh, within the uh, grounds of Windsor, and then they get bussed in on this park-and-ride, and they've been trying to get the drivers to stop so that the guests can walk and right every, past. every time they do stop so that they can get a good look at what the guests are wearing they they give a cheer actually they gave you a cheer when well, you walk past i don't think they actually knew who i was but they... anyway these people there's uh, six thousand of them uh, uh, not these who are going into the chapel as actual guests of the wedding but the people out there uh, in Castle Hill here, yes. actually had to write in and ask for tickets, and they went, I think, within a couple of hours or so. There's also some specially um, created scaffolding in some of the cottages here as well. Yes, I mean, I think uh, that's the knights of the, uh, the military knights here in the castle. We've got grace and favour residences up the, up the side there, and they can watch these buses as they come <laughs> back and forth. Oh, you now see that, that minibus, nice you see, they've, they've gone too far. Yeah, they Should have yeah. dropped the guests She's, off a little bit earlier. She, she looks particularly disappointed. Oh, there's another cheer going up. <laughs> <laughs> it is lovely, even just walking around the town this morning, looking in the windows and, and the effort so many of the shops have gone to, and, and all the children out, and they've been standing there for so long. Absolutely uh, tremendous to see uh, such yes, a reaction. 
they said beforehand that there wasn't much interest in this wedding, yet the <laughs> atmosphere in the town is really quite extraordinary, isn't it? People were queuing up there about sort of six o'clock this morning yeah. when I came out of the hotel here. It's a nervous time now, uh, isn't it? It's getting very close. Yeah. Getting well, very close. it's, of course, particularly, uh, uh, you know, you can't afford to be late because um, uh, under the law of the land, still under the law of the land, if the marriage vows don't take place um, uh, until six o'clock, uh, it would be invalid if it happens after six o'clock, so they've got to get it over with. <laughs> Rather grim thought. We're looking up the long walk now uh, towards um, the Copper Horse statue, and the Royal Lodge is off to the left behind those trees. And the first car we're expecting is, uh, is the car containing um, Sophie's mother, uh, which will be coming down from the left, turning right at the top there of Long Walk, which is this great, long, straight, road that was built in the orders of Charles II right up to the gates of Windsor Castle. And of course also in, in that car as well will be uh, Sarah Sienesi who was an old friend of uh, Sophie's. They took ballet classes together when they were very young and, and stayed very close friends and, and in fact were flatmates the first time that uh, she moved to London so it's lovely to have one of her old friends because in that lodge it must be a very very tense time for Sophie. Uh, here are more of the invited uh, invited guests. I think we're getting to the stage where they're members of uh, foreign royal families. We think, in fact, this is the Sultan of Brunei's retinue, but it's a bit difficult to tell from this angle. Uh, we think we think we've just spotted him, Sultan of Brunei, thought to be. No, well, I don't know whether anybody can prove it. The richest man in the world. Ah, there he is. If he isn't. If he isn't the richest man in the world, he's very he's so close to it, it doesn't make any difference. So. <laughs> and he's a supporter of uh, Edward's uh, production company, Ardent, as well. I believe he's got an investment in it, yes. So now we started with uh, the royalty from abroad uh, coming into, coming into uh, the chapel. And still we wait the first of the cars from the Royal Lodge. The Sultan being greeted by attendants at the West Gate. This is by far the grandest wedding in Windsor, but there have been two others today. <laughs> <laughs> One of them, the couple were rather miffed, and the other <laughs> thought it actually made their wedding, but maybe we'll get a chance to... We actually heard earlier when they pulled up that they got a massive cheer. <laughs> <laughs> they arrived in a white Rolls Royce. No Sultan of Brunei, no royal family. But they had a wonderful time, I think. And there it is. There's the car that contains uh, Mary Rhys Jones. Uh, the mother of, uh, of, of the bride. A big day for her. A very big day for her. A proud we, day. Sue and I were speaking to her um, <laughs> yesterday, and I asked her if she was nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, only when you ask me. <laughs> Apparently everyone's been phoning her up saying, are you nervous? And, and she hasn't been until people have mentioned it. But... She didn't look at all nervous then, but I bet there's a flutter in her stomach now. And of course, her outfit has been uh, designed by Samantha Shaw as well, so it'd be interesting to see what uh, what she's wearing. And her hair has been done by Andrew Collins. Yes. Though, whether, I'm not sure whether we're meant to mention that. <laughs> anyway, it's a Daimler from the Royal Mews heading towards the castle. Two and a half miles, uh, that journey, so she'll be a little time before she arrives. Uh, the Queen and Prince Philip are already here at the castle. Uh, they've been here all week for Royal Ascot, which is only a few miles away. Um, and of course, everybody has been pouring into Windsor uh, for a glimpse, not particularly of the bride's mother, it has to be said, <laughs> but of the bride as she comes into the castle. So they're packed out into the town, and our man in the street out there is Wesley Kerr. What are they saying out there, Wesley? Well, Michael, it's a great atmosphere here in the high street. Thousands of people have been waiting here for hours for that tantalizing glimpse of the bride and they haven't got long to wait as she's driven into the castle just a few yards from here with her party almost her last act as a single person i was among the massive crowds outside buckingham palace for the last two royal weddings they were very much state occasions this is really quite an intimate much almost a family occasion but the people here still say they feel part of it some have said to me that they feel this is almost a people's wedding hoping to see as much as possible. I've brought the three children for a nice day out. We've never seen anything like this before. 
and um, I'm hoping it's going to be really special. <laughs> Here's my ticket for the inside the, the grounds. Um, I've been here since half past six. I'm hoping to get a very good view of all the family and, and other guests. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. It should be a great occasion. We're really looking forward to like, yeah, seeing the dress. Seeing the dress, yeah, everyone's been talking about it. Yeah. What, what are you expecting it like? to be? Well, she said she wanted something quite simple, which would be quite a nice, nice change. Nice, yeah, definitely, yeah. Well, this is my fifth royal wedding since 1981, and I felt I wanted to be here for this uh, important royal occasion. I'm 101% I'm certain that this marriage is going to be a great success. They're a very modern couple, this is what they want. It would be nice to have a slightly high, higher profile, but everyone's here to enjoy and wish them well. Well, it's just really special because um, we weren't born when Diana got married, so... It's something else, same yeah. bit we've been in when we're older. So what's your message from Inverness to the bride and groom? Oh, every best wish. I mean, after all, I think they will be happy. Don't you? I hope so. Yes, I think so. They seem a nice, genuine couple. I'm quite certain their marriage will last, and I hope them and wish them every happiness in the world. You can see now the Duke and Duchess of Kent have just arrived, rather unceremoniously, in a minibus. And Lady Helen Taylor and her husband. The Duchess of Kent always looks elegant. Trini, what do you, it's what beautiful. Do you make of her and This little bolero jacket a lot of people are wearing these days, and it's a great alternative to a scarf, which can be a little bit more casual. And And I think the Duchess of Kent is wearing a Catherine Walker dress there. Catherine Walker makes a lot of clothes. For the royals. Greeting there the Dean of Windsor, the ushers, Peter Phillips there you can see. And Princess Anne. And her husband and Zara Phillips there behind. Oh and that's the first gl glimpse we've had of Prince Harry and Prince William. You can just see him there. And Eugenie and Beatrice, the daughters of Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson. Now, at last, we get a glimpse of the bridegroom and his two supporters. That's what the royal family call their best men, Prince Charles and Prince Andrew. Well, they've, the three of them have decided to walk down from, <laughs> uh, from the apartments there. Interesting that uh, the supporters, not best, 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 either of them best man, as Fiona was saying, uh, in their morning dress, like the rest of the guests, not their naval uniforms, which, uh, which they themselves got married in. Distinct lack of uniforms yes. at this wedding soon. And Prince Charles yeah. wearing grey, which I think we heard earlier, wasn't uh, it? Was rather frowned on, actually. <laughs> it was they, seem rather to, frowned they seem to be able to break the rules, we don't they? wouldn't question it. But you actually uh, saw Prince Edward this morning. I didn't did. He was very cheery, waved his hand, and said, uh, and said, Good luck to me, which I thought was a bit <laughs> silly, really, under the circumstances, but very nice of him. <laughs> and they've just been passed by the Queen, by the Queen Mother who's coming down by car, and I think at her age, what, she's still 98, not quite 99. Uh, that seems perfectly reasonable to me. She's not coming round by the west door. She's going in uh, a side entrance that they call the Galilee porch. But she gets a special cheer. There's the Galilee porch. be helping her out and into her seat. She wouldn't have missed this for the world. Yes, tremendous yes. cheers. And she's wearing a hat. Well, we thought, we thought that she might, and we actually think that the Queen will as well. But 99 <laughs> on the 4th of August, and there they are. The bridegroom, his two supporters, walking down Chapel Hill to his marriage.
getting a really big cheer. And when we were walking out there, people were trying to find out, do you know where they're going to be walking? Because they wanted to get the best view and, and wish him well on his wedding day. And uh, he's certainly getting a great reception. I think he had a look up there looking for the aircraft. I think he had a quiet word with the, the people at Heathrow. The planes come very low over here about every two minutes. I managed to speak to him yesterday about that because he said they, they could sort of divert, but not the landing. However, if they're being very kind, they could use the south landing strip and therefore be a mile and a half away from uh, the castle. But it doesn't look as though that's happened. But they've given those people who, who, who balloted for the tickets to stay there inside the, uh, inside the castle grounds. Um, they've given them a perfect glimpse. Of, uh, of him before his wedding. I think he's now realizing exactly how much it means to the public. He wanted his private wedding, but uh, the public certainly wanted a royal wedding. Well, he made that decision, and I think as he goes through into the horseshoe cloister and then into the chapel, he'll have realized he's made the right decision, I think. <laughs> There's more of a crowd there to watch him in. and they walk up the west steps now into the chapel. And Edward's not going to wait for his bride by the altar like most bridegrooms. He's going to wait in what's called the Bray Chantry or Chapel Bookshop. Prince Charles, we're told, has the rings. They're both going to be carrying, both going to be wearing rings. Prince Edward there being greeted by the Dean of Windsor. The Dean of Windsor there is wearing a ceremonial coat displaying the emblems of the patron saints of the chapel, Edward the Confessor, the Cross of St. George, and the lilies of the Virgin Mary. Everyone stands to greet the royal princes. And they're now being what's called verged, verged down the nave by the verger, who's carrying a 17th century verge made of silver. That used to be carried to beat people out of the way, not anymore. And here comes the Queen Mother taking her place, having come through the Galilee porch. They're now going towards the bookshop to calm a few last-minute nerves. Perhaps they can take a glance at the tea towels on sale, the commemorative china for today's wedding, and Prince of Prince Charles's watercolours. There's even some books of love poems if they need a few. A little bit of last-minute inspiration. There they go into the bookshop of the Edward IV Chantry, built by King Edward IV. And you can see all the books back there. And the Queen Mother there with Princess Margaret. You can't quite see it, but Princess Margaret is actually in a wheelchair. Um, she's still not quite recovered from uh, the when she she burnt burnt her feet in the bath early this year. And there we have Prince William studying the, studying the order of service. And you can see all the flowers there in the choir. There are 101 individual posies around the lamps, made of sweet peas and white roses. Prince Harry having a good look round. Princess Anne. Her husband, Captain Timothy Lawrence.
And we believe that's the car with the uh, with the bridesmaids and the page boys. Here. Yes, and that hopefully will give us a bit of a clue because just look at it, there they are, they're waving, <laughs> isn't that lovely? But so uh, we were looking in the church at the flowers, the white and the green, and just a hint of blue, and we just wondered whether blue just might be the colour that uh, that they will be wearing. Well, we ought to say who they are. There's uh, Camilla Haddon, who's eight, and she's a goddaughter of Prince Edward's. Uh, Olivia Taylor, who's five. Uh, Harry Warburton, who's six. And Felix Sauerbutz, who's seven. I wonder what they call him at school. <laughs> Felix, I'm sure. Yeah, they're older actually, aren't they, than bridesmaids and page boys often are at these weddings? Yes, uh, Sophie sort of gave a hint to the dress because she said she wasn't going to choose children of three or four years old because she was worried that they'd step on the train. So I think we can uh, safely can, assume yes, there's a train. that there will be a train to Sophie's dress. Well, this is the, uh, the view from the top of the Round Tower. Originally, of course, uh, the site for William the Conqueror's castle, built and rebuilt, the great central tower at the centre of Windsor Castle, waiting for the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh to leave their personal uh, apartments in the castle uh, to come down to the chapel for the wedding. And there they are, coming through the Norman Gate in one of their their second best phantom Rolls Royce, because I think the best one uh, <laughs> is probably up at the Royal Lodge for, for Sophie. And actually, yes, the junior driver, because <laughs> her personal driver, uh, Joe Last, uh, is up at the Royal Lodge doing that duty. The Queen, in fact, has got two of these phantom Rolls Royces with the Perspex cover at the back, which lets people have a good view of them. Now, the Queen's wearing a hat as well. Yes, I think we uh, assume that uh, that would happen. The Queen's been here all week um, at Royal Ascot, with actually quite a number of the family and quite a lot of friends as well. They're out of sight of the people out in the Chapel Hill in the lower ward of the castle. Tremendous atmosphere here. Mm. She got a really warm welcome. And the Dean of Windsor was just coming down the steps there to greet the Queen, who, contrary to speculation, is not wearing a hat. He's wearing ostrich feathers. Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. And the Dean of Windsor will escort them up the West Steps where a procession will form. You can see the verger there leading the way up the steps. These West Steps are actually the most recent addition to the chapel. Previously, there used to just be a sort of muddy mound that, that the monarch had to walk up. I think things are a lot better now. Trini, tell me a bit about what the Queen's wearing. She's got a chiffon skirt on, I think, and then over it is this very pretty lilac lace round neck. I think it's a very soft colour on her, and she's made extra special effort it's very soft also to have all these ostrich feathers instead of a hat it's a very unusual look for the queen isn't it we're used to seeing her in much more formal we are it's, it's less structured perhaps now while the queen and prince philip are waiting outside the choir is forming a procession inside the queen can't just walk into the chapel there has to be a procession to lead her in You can see all the, the public there. Those are members of the public, not necessarily members of the staff, just members of the public who applied for tickets. You've got a pretty good view there. You can see everyone who turns up in this horseshoe cloister built in the 15th century. And, and there's the copper statue. There's the car. There's Sophie in the number one <laughs> Rolls Royce of the royal family. And ribbons for the first time. I believe that's the very the first time there's been a white ribbon on that. But Enough of all that. Let's <laughs> let's get the first glimpse. 
Now, we thought there would be a train. You were right. And, uh, Is that white or ivory, would you say? Well, there was all talk about it being a pale coffee, but it's certainly not that. It, uh, it does look like ivory. Beautiful. With her father, uh, Christopher, of course. Now, just imagine what must be going through her mind now. Uh, that long walk, two and a half miles, and on the ridge there, on the horizon, Windsor Castle, which has been the fortress of the British monarchy for the last thousand years. And she's going down there at 18 miles an hour to her future, joining the firm. That's what the royal family call their family business. And the Queen being verged through the chapel there, everyone curtsying as she passes. A lot of these people are friends, so although there's 550 people here, it is by the Queen's standards a much less formal occasion. That's the choir in front of her. Some 23 boy choristers and 12 what are called lay clerks or adult choristers making their way under the organ screen, beneath the organ, into the choir. mother arriving. A very proud day for her, Mary Reese Jones. She used to work as a secretary. She didn't think she ever imagined she'd be at something like this, greeted by the dean there. And of course Sophie's brother there did. And the bride's mother, he's also wearing an outfit, as we heard before, made by Samantha Shaw. Designed Sophie's dress. And there we have the royal family all sitting down waiting for the bride to arrive. This is not like any other wedding they've been to. It's quite a change for them. And now Sophie's mother and her brother David are verged along the nave to take their places up in the choir. They'll be sitting opposite the Queen. They look pretty relaxed, actually. I should think there must be some butterflies in there somewhere. And you can see that Dave is just wearing a simple rosebud. That's what all the buttonholes are here today, just simple rosebuds, very plain. And there are the bridesmaids just coming through the streets of Windsor. Also the car, Samantha Shaw, the designer of the, uh, the dress. We just had that sneakiest of glimpses of, and we'll see more in a little while. And she mentioned that it's been, it's been quite difficult in the build-up because Sophie, like all brides, has lost quite a bit of weight for, for her big day and she's had to take the dress in a couple of times. Has that been deliberate, uh, the losing the weight, or is it the worry, do you think? <laughs> Probably a little she's of lost, both. I, I, I gather she's lost about a stone. She looks sensational. Mm. Anyway, that's... Turning into Park Street leads into the high street which then leads into the castle this is where the crowds have really been building up oh yes we ought to point out that those just in case you're a flag watcher and wonder what those green red and white flags are they're the flags they're the Hungarian flags the state visit of the Hungarian president uh, Mr. Grunch his name is on Tuesday slightly confusing for today's yes wedding What a thrill for those children. All commoners, of course, which is uh, another change for a royal wedding. And there's the bride. And she talked to me a lot about her nerves. I mean, apart from, as you mentioned, the, the drive up to the castle and her future, she talked about the wedding day itself and how nervous she was of walking up. Well, we counted them 20 steps to the top and then another two into the chapel. That's daunting for any bride. And also inside the chapel, we've seen that the, the chairs face the aisle. So everybody will, uh, will see her. 
and the bridesmaids almost at the end of this journey. They time this journey, I think it takes about 18 minutes to get from the Royal Lodge to, uh, to, the, to the chapel. They take it at a pretty steady pace. And of course, if there is a train for the dress, it's going to be a big day for the bridesmaids uh, yes, today. Yes, just think how terrible it would be to step on it. <laughs> <laughs> it does look like it's a dark colour, just trying to get a glimpse through the window there. But in, we'll see in just a moment. There they go, through the outer gate of the castle. And, and here's Sophie uh, on her way still. And I was just talking about her nerves about uh, mm. walking into the chapel because, as I was mentioning, the, the seats face the aisle, so everyone is going to be looking at her. And I said, that Not must just be looking so over their shoulder. daunting, exactly. Yeah. And she said, I think I'm going to keep my eyes firmly on the floor to start with and then on Edward. What about the... Um, nerves of the other person in the car her father Christopher he was saying he, he was saying that uh, when he was first told that his daughter was going out with Prince Edward was the first time he needed a gin and tonic before 10 o'clock in the morning might have needed another one today I think, I think a pretty stiff one after six o'clock now here are the bridesmaids and that they're, they're just coming down into the castle Let's see what they're wearing today. Will that give us a clue for what she, as to uh, what she's wearing or not? Do you think so? No, it th looks like she's chosen chosen a dark colour for the page boys and the bridesmaids. But uh, Sophie's dress looked, uh, as as we were saying, sort of ivory, and it looked. Uh, we think it's going to be quite classical because that's Samantha Shaw's style, very elegant and, and very Sophie, really. But uh, this, this will certainly give us some indication. And bridesmaids and, and the payboys pull up outside the west steps. They must be so excited. And the Bishop of Norwich there, ready to greet them. Now I think you can see there, with a the short hess. Ah, that's who you can see, Prince Edward, coming out of the bookshop, out of the Bray Chantry to take his place. being led there, I think, by the sacristan. Prince Charles putting his fingers in his pockets, probably checking he's got the rings in there. Oh, and they look absolutely beautiful, don't they? Waving there. And that's the dress designer, Samantha Shaw, on the right, just putting the finishing touches to their outfit. And Sarah Warburton on the left is a private secretary, Prince Edward, and also the mother of one of the bridesmaids. Trini, what do you think of their Well, I immediately get the feeling of Knights of the Garter, actually. You remember when the Queen Mother comes up in that ceremony, and there's, there is a sense of that, and we're in the right place for it. The lovely navy blue velvet tunics over what looks like um, silk velvet, silk taffeta, long sleeve fitted tops, and the little boys in, in their little breeches of velvet sewn. They have little hats on the girls by Cosmo Drinks. The bride's car, just coming out of Windsor Great Park. 5,000 acres in the Great Park. They could have gone directly into the castle without going through the town. But that would have been being spoiled sports, wouldn't it? <laughs> so they're just about to take a sharp left turn to the Park Street gate and into the town itself. Any clues, Sue? Come on, you've got sharper eyes than I have. <laughs> it does. It, it does look very, very simple, very elegant, very flowing. You can see uh, just a little bit, just not quite off the shoulder, but uh, absolutely beautiful. And this must be amazing for Sophie because she's such a private person, and uh, now to be paraded through the town, it uh, it goes against what she wants. But then this will be a very special day for her. I hope she's enjoying it as well as feeling nervous. She's actually just now coming through a chicane between Park Street and High Street. See a little left and a right, <laughs> little left and a right. And going up High Street, and this is where the two other weddings are taking place, one in Castle Street on the, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, and one at the Guild Hall on the right. As I was saying, the ones at the Castle Street uh, were pretty miff. They felt pretty overshadowed. <laughs> They've taken a year to arrange but, it, apparently. Yeah, exactly. But the ones in the, in the Guild Hall who are having their reception there uh, were really terribly pleased and sent them a message. They told, uh, they told us, in fact, that it's really added to their sense of occasion. Mm -hmm. 
and Ed would help them as well. Oh, absolutely, yes. I understand that, uh, uh, you know, because they'd booked their wedding before he booked his. <laughs> So he's, um, he's coughed up £250, I gather, to provide them all with a coach because he didn't think any of the wedding guests would be able to park in Winchester. I was going to say parking would be a problem. Nice gesture. Ah, that's a great show. Now, you told me she was going to be wearing a veil. Mm-hmm. Or was that a real given? <laughs> well, we felt that uh, she would. It does look uh, lovely, a V-neck and... and uh... As I've said before, very Sophie, just looking at the style that she's chosen uh, over the years, very uh, fitted, very, very simple, very classic, and she seems to uh, want that. We heard earlier from, uh, from her makeup artist that she wanted to be herself on her day, and I think uh, she has certainly provided that. There she is as she goes through the advanced gate. Actually, it's the way the tourists get into Windsor Castle uh, every day except today, she's leaning forward. So that she can get a good view, or maybe not to crush the dress. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, her father looks as if he's in control of things. <laughs> in a moment, they'll disappear from sight as they go up into the castle through the through the outer gate, and that's and that's where we we'll lose them just for a few moments as they go through an area which is now private for this wedding, but actually tourists can normally see. They'll be driving round the Round Tower, which is right at the core of the castle there. And it was where King James I uh, was locked up for 11 years in the early 1400s. And while he was locked up, he looked down into the garden and he saw Lady Jane Beaufort, and he rather fancied her, thought she was extremely pretty, and fell in love with her. And when he was released from the prison, he married her. One of the more successful uh, royal marriages, I think. Well, Michael, with all due respect, if he'd been locked up for 11 years, I wouldn't be surprised if even the gardener was looking quite good to him at that point. <laughs> <laughs> but trust, it's a lovely story trust, and a very romantic one for trust today. Trust you to lower the tone. <laughs> anyway, we're looking down from the top of the Round Tower, and there's the car coming out from that detour around the back of the Round Tower and coming the same route that the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh uh, came down. And now the people who've got the tickets to be inside the castle can get their view. This is what they've been waiting Absolutely. for. Absolutely. And she's a little late. I wonder if she's worried about the uh, six o'clock. Well, we day. reckon she's about ten minutes late. So she's got, uh, by my watch, 53 minutes to exchange the vows or they'll have to do it all over again. <laughs> but this is her big moment, just uh, coming close to the chapel now. And uh, good luck, Sophie. It's a grand car to get married in, isn't it? Built in 1977 um, by the Society of Auto Manufacturers and Traders to mark the Silver Jubilee of the Queen. So many cameras out uh, taking, well, taking you, the pictures, recording the you moment. Could, you can hear people yelling from here, can't you? She's nearing those steps. Absolutely. <laughs> Sophie Rees-Jones for not much longer. And the car pulls up there to the west steps. Bishop of Norwich ready to greet her, and at last, we're about to get a proper glimpse of the dress. Her designer there helping her out, making sure that everything is just in place as she gets out of the car. A bit tricky with that long, long dress. Looks like she's wearing a coat over a dress made of silk organza, and quite a lot of heavy beading at the neck. What a beautiful veil on made of silk tulle. She looks absolutely beautiful, I think. I don't think anyone's going to be disappointed by how she looks today. Her father, I don't think we've mentioned, it's her father's birth, his fa father's birthday today. So it's an especially important day for him. Lovely tiara as well. True. I think that's been loaned by the Queen and made by Aspreys. And very important now to make sure the dress is absolutely right as it goes up the steps. Sophie's already said the one thing she's very nervous about is tripping up the steps. And then the we wind is the added factor. Very important job for the paid boys and bridesmaids there. To hold on to the train, make sure it looks just right. And a lovely cheer from the crowd there. Beautiful smile from Sophie. She looks relaxed.
And she's going to walk up these steps, a commoner, and walk out a member of the royal family. especially composed for Sophie, played by Her Majesty's Royal Marine Band. And she walks up the steps now to the Marsh Era Week. And she walks into a chapel steeped in the history of the royal family, to which she's about to belong. It was built by a king 700 years ago to be the focus of royal worship down the centuries, and today she'll join that long lineage. She's already said it's a nerve-wracking prospect, but she's ready for it. She's wearing a very beautiful necklace, which I understand has been given to her by Prince Edward on the occasion of her wedding. Black and white pearls made by Asprey's and Garrels again. And Edward, in fact, helped design that, that jewellery for okay. her, so it's a very personal present to her. Yes. Smile from Sophie, looking very relaxed. And she's about to take her place under the organ screen, which is where the first part of the ceremony will take place. And there you are, Prince Edward has had his first glimpse of his bride. And this will be the introduction next by the Bishop of Norwich. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is an honourable estate instituted of God himself, signifying unto us the mystical union that is betwixt Christ and his church, which holy estate Christ adorned and beautified with his presence and first miracle that he wrought in Cana of Galilee and is commended in Holy Writ to be honourable among all men and therefore is not by any to be enterprised nor taken in hand unadvisedly, lightly or wantonly but reverently, discreetly, soberly and in the fear of God duly considering the causes for which matrimony was ordained. First, it was ordained for the increase of mankind according to the will of God, and that children might be brought up in the fear and nurture of the Lord and to the praise of his holy name. Secondly, it was ordained that the natural instincts and affections implanted by God should be hallowed and directed aright, that those who are called of God to this holy estate should continue therein in pureness of living. Thirdly, it was ordained for the mutual society, help and comfort that the one ought to have of the other, both in prosperity and adversity. Into which holy estate these two persons present come now to be joined. Therefore, if any man can show any just cause, why they may not lawfully be joined together, let him now speak, or else hereafter forever hold his peace. And now the hymn, Ye Holy Angels Bright, 
Sophie and Edward will walk separately down the choir to the high altar. Because they're not yet man and wife, so they won't walk together. Sophie hasn't yet been given away by her father. I require and charge you both, as you will answer at the dreadful day of judgment, when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you know any impediment, why ye may not be lawfully joined together in matrimony, ye do now confess it. For be ye well assured that so many as are coupled together otherwise than God's word doth allow, are not joined together by God, neither is their matrimony lawful. Edward, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife to live together according to God's law in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her so long as ye both shall live? I will. Sophie, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband, to live together according to God's law in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in sickness and in health? And forsaking all other, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live. I will. Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? I, Edward Anthony Richard Louis. I, Edward Anthony Richard Louis. Take thee, Sophie Helen. Take thee, Sophie Helen. To my wedded wife. To my wedded wife. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. 
to love and to cherish, to love and to cherish, till death us do part, till death us do part, according to God's holy law, according to God's holy law, and thereto, and thereto, I give thee my troth, I give thee my troth. I, Sophie Helen, I, Sophie Helen, take thee, Edward Anthony Richard Louis, take thee, Edward Anthony Richard Louis, to my wedded husband, to my wedded husband, to have and to hold, to have and to hold, from this day forward, from this day forward, for better, for worse, better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, in sickness and in health, to love, cherish, and to obey. To love, cherish, and obey. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto. And thereto. I give thee my troth. I give thee my troth. Bless, O Lord, this ring which we hallow in thy name, that he who gives it and she who wears it may abide in thy peace, continue in thy favor, go on and grow old in thy love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. With this ring I thee wed. With this ring I thee wed. With my body I thee honour. With my body I thee honour. And all my worldly goods. And all my worldly goods. With thee I share. With thee I share. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Father. And of the Son. And of the Son. And of the Holy Ghost. And of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. O eternal God, creator and preserver of all mankind, giver of all spiritual grace, the author of everlasting life, send thy blessing upon these thy servants, this man and this woman whom we bless in thy name, that living faithfully together, they may surely perform and keep the vow and covenant betwixt them made, whereof this ring given and received is a token and pledge and may ever remain in perfect love and peace together, and live according to thy laws, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Those whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Forasmuch as Edward and Sophie have consented together in holy wedlock, and have witnessed the same before God and this company, and thereto have given and pledged their troth either to other, and have declared the same by giving and receiving of a ring and by joining of hands, I pronounce that they be man and wife together, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, bless, preserve, and keep you. The Lord mercifully with his favor look upon you, and so fill you with all spiritual benediction and grace, that ye may so live together in this life, that in the world to come ye may have life everlasting. Amen. So Edward and Sophie, or the Duke and Duchess of Wessex as they are now, are officially man and wife. Now the hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
Sophie's brother David will read the lesson now from the first letter of John, chapter 4, verses 7 to 11. A reading from the first letter of John. Dear friends, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but the unloving know nothing of God. For God is love, and his love was disclosed to us in this, that he sent his only son into the world to bring us life. The love I speak of is not our love for God, but the love he showed to us in sending his Son as the remedy for the defilement of our sins. If God thus loved us, dear friends, we in turn are bound to love one another. Prayers now, and the Dean of Windsor will step forward for the first time to assume his role in the service. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, save thy servant and thy handmaid. O Lord, send them help from thy holy place. Be unto them a tower of strength, O Lord, hear our prayer. O God of our fathers, bless these thy servants and sow the seed of eternal life in their hearts, that whatsoever in thy holy word they shall profitably learn, they may indeed fulfill the same, that so obeying thy will and always being in safety under thy protection, they may abide in thy love unto their lives' end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O merciful Lord and heavenly Father, by whose gracious gift mankind is increased, bestow, we beseech thee, upon these two persons the heritage and gift of children, and grant that they may live together so long in godly love and honesty, that they may see their children Christianly and virtuously brought up to thy praise and honour, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, who has taught us that it should never be lawful to put asunder those whom thou by matrimony hadst made one, and has consecrated the state of matrimony to such an excellent mystery that in it is signified and represented the spiritual marriage and unity betwixt Christ and his church. Look mercifully upon these thy servants, that both this man may love his wife according to thy word, as Christ did love his spouse, the church, who gave himself for it, loving and cherishing it, even as his own flesh. And also that this woman may be loving and amiable and faithful to her husband, and in all quietness, sobriety and peace, be a follower of holy and godly women. 
O Lord, bless them both and grant them to inherit thy everlasting kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, pour upon you the riches of his grace, sanctify and bless you, that ye may please him both in body and soul, and live together in holy love unto your life's end. Amen. And we'll hear the choir now for the first time sing on their own. Sing the motet Ubi Caritas under the direction of the organist and master of the choristers, Jonathan Rhys Williams. Bishop of Norwich now will say the blessing. God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. A fanfare now, followed by the last hymn, that all the world in every corner sing.
Sophie and Edward have retired to sign the register behind the high chapel there in the ambulatory. They'll just be signing it on a plain oak desk. Then there'll be a few photographs afterwards. They also have to sign a royal register later on up at the castle, and that's because of the Royal Marriage Act since 1772. All royal marriages required the permission of the sovereign. That was because George III was outraged when his brother, the Duke of Cumberland, married a commoner, and he wanted to prevent it happening again. Though I don't think anybody minds today that Prince Edward has married a commoner, though she is, of course, now the Duchess of Wessex. And now the anthem, The Spirit of the Lord, by Elgar. Sophie's brother there. His role in the service over now. He can relax. What you're hearing now is an introduction on the organ, which was presented by King George III in 1719. It's been rebuilt about six times, most recently in 1965. Prince and Princess Michael of Kent there. And the Queen Mother, she stayed there. She hasn't gone back to sign the register. Duke and Duchess of Kent. They're sitting in the choir stalls there, which are actually hinge seats, Princess Margaret. They're hinge seats so that people can stand, can lean on the seats, but appear to be standing, which I guess is very useful during long services. Prince Harry there.
images there of the last royal wedding of the 20th century. Sophie and Edward's happy day, and now the familiar Amen chorus from the Messiah by Handel. Back in her place, the register's been signed now. A fanfare, followed by the national anthem.
Edward and Sophie, Earl and Countess of Wessex, a bow and a courtesy to the Queen, man and wife. Walking through the choir now to Vidor's Toccata. Time to relax now, greet their friends. For Sophie now, life will never be the same again. Now as a member of the royal family, many aspects of her life will be public property be photographed wherever she goes. Whatever it is she does, she must remember she's no longer playing Sophie Rhys Jones, but has a place and responsibilities within the monarchy. Well, they don't seem to be weighing too heavy on her today. A smile for her groom, for her husband there. And as they walk through the 16th century nave, smile for their friends, the bridesmaids and page boys who behaved so well, walking behind them. And you can't quite see it, but the carriages are drawing up outside. They're just coming out now, outside to stand on the west steps, to the cheers of the crowd outside. The Earl and the Countess of Wessex. He became Earl this morning. She became the Countess of Wessex when she took her vows. And she will become known as Sophie Wessex. A professional name. Sophie Wessex and the bells. Now the members of both families coming out to join them on the steps for what well, it happens at every wedding at this stage for the photographs. Now I hope we'll get a, a sight, Sue, of the gifts that they've given each other. Yes, because the bride is actually wearing a black and white pearl necklace and matching pair of black and white pearl drop earrings. They've been designed by His Royal Highness the Prince Edward and made by Asprey and Garrard. And these are a personal present from His Royal Highness to Sophie more, on their big day. A bit more romantic than his first present, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the first Christmas after they met, he gave her a suitcase, which didn't go down terribly well. Very practical. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. Men always get these things wrong, don't they? But I think he got it right He got today. it right today, yeah. And uh, she's given him um, an 18 carat yellow gold hunter pocket watch on a similar 18 carat uh, yellow gold watch chain. Can't really see it. Maybe, maybe it's tucked. tucked you can away. just see it poking out there uh, of his waistcoat. Perhaps he was, um, perhaps he was looking at it rather sharply as she was a little bit late arriving. <laughs> well, there's that necklace. It's a beautiful. Stunning, one. absolutely stunning, and the uh, and Sophie's tiara as well. Uh, was designed and remodeled by the Crown jeweller David Thomas. The tiara is from the private collection of Her Majesty the Queen. Now, I wonder if the photographer is better drilled than most wedding photographers who tend to get nervous at this particular point <laughs> and ordering people around. It would be a bit <laughs> difficult in these circumstances. Here are, the, here are the carriages for the ride... for the ride through the town. Um, so that the people out in the town can get a glimpse of uh, uh, the Earl and the new Countess. Well, it looks they were going to spend about 10 minutes on the steps there for the photo call, but perhaps because it's going great, right, House because it was going late, they've cut that and they'll have the photographs later at the reception. Anyway. It's a beautiful dress, uh, as we said, designed by Samantha Shaw. 
and just talk a little bit about the detail of the dress, which consists of rows of pearls and crystal beading around the neck, the sleeves and the train. There's further beading down the back and the front of the dress coat. In total, there's about 325,000 cut glass and pearl beads that have been sewn onto the dress. And that will be the photograph that will dominate the papers tomorrow. It certainly will. It certainly will. There are two uh, uh, carriages in this drive. Um, Edward and Sophie will be in the first one. And following them will be the bridesmaids and the page boys, which would really make the end of an extraordinary day for them. And there they go, out of the Horseshoe Cloister. These are the, uh, the Queen's Ascot Landors and have been in pretty heavy use this week, taking the royal family from Windsor uh, down the race course at Ascot for the, for the race meeting. Oh, wow. Tremendous reception. It was lovely that even during the service, the crowd was cheering all the way through. It was uh, fabulous, I think. The postillions, they're the chaps who are riding the horses, um, are in semi-state livery. Edward and Sophie's Landor are being drawn by Two greys called Alderney and Twilight. They've had an ex oh, four greys. The first two were Alderney and Twilight. Had a very heavy week. Not just Ascot, but they were at the Trooping the Colour as well. Part of the reason for the drive is that, of course, here at Windsor, there's no balcony, as there was at Buckingham Palace for the other royal weddings. For the bride and the groom to show themselves to the people after the ceremony. And it's lovely that the weather has held because there's been a few dark clouds around uh, Windsor this afternoon. But... Dark clouds and loud aircraft as well. I think Concorde came over at a rather key moment, <laughs> but the walls are very thick, I think. <laughs> They're retracing their steps now back up uh, Chapel Hill. Past the crowds up there just see all the BBC vehicles uh, in the back there. People have actually been sneaking through to watch, it, watch the, te the television service on, on the monitors there. There's a queen returning to her apartments for the reception. Edward and Sophie have now, in retracing their steps, gone out of sight of the crowd into the more private area on the other side of the round tower. Those gardens, incidentally, you can see on the right-hand side, heavy with the smell of roses, the governor's garden. Bells of Windsor ringing out. I don't know whether you can hear them at home, but we can hear them where we are, perched up here on the curtain wall. And that's the Queen Mother returning. She really enjoys these occasions. It's a special cheer, too. The carriages with Sophie and Edward, the Earl and the Countess, we expect to see coming round from behind the round tower there and out through the outer gate. You can just see them now. A very patient crowd is uh, ready to greet them as they come <laughs> through. And then they'll go through the streets uh, of Windsor once again. It's uh, quite surprising to know that back in 1851, the town was described as one of the dirtiest and unhealthiest in the country. Now, of course, one of the most charming and looking at its best today. Oh, it's a great view of them, isn't it? They're coming down Castle Hill now to the great statue of Queen Victoria <laughs> at the bottom of it. It was done for her Golden Jubilee in 1887 after she'd spent 
well, I think something like 20 years in virtual retreat after the death of uh, Prince Albert. It marked, it was a difficult time then for the royal family, and it marked a return to more public life. You'll soon be able to see that statue coming into sight on the left-hand side, just at the bottom of the castle hill. There's the Postilians. Nigel Day and Kevin Hutchinson. The horse is very cool about this. They've been practicing all week with Asker. Down through the advance gate with the statue of Victoria just at the bottom of the street. Just off Castle Hill, behind them is a narrow street which leads to the cloisters there where Nell Gwynne once had lodgings. She's got a strong arm, she could presumably have flung an orange into the, <laughs> into the castle precincts. Oh, I say. We've got a camera on the carriage, which is, I was about to say, a Sophie's eye view, but I hope she <laughs> sees quite. more than the back end of the horse. <laughs> So but it gives the, you an idea of what it's like to be travelling along in the carriage. They're into the High Street and there's a lovely Queen Charlotte Street just uh, off to the left, just before the Guildhall. And it's recorded in the Guinness Book of Records as the shortest street in England, just 51 feet and 10 inches. And at the end there's a little uh, tea shop that you know, Michael. Yes, <laughs> a, a tea shop that closed for tea and wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't serve me. There you go. Of course, they're passing the receptions of the uh, two other weddings in Windsor. Uh, I think so, yes. I hope nobody's making a speech. <laughs> <laughs> Back down towards that, uh, that kink in the road that gets to Park Street. Oh, yes. That really gives you a sense of what it must be like to be sitting in the carriage. It's a very elegant 18th century street, High Street and running into Park Street, where you've got all that bit about it being terribly squalid in Victorian <laughs> times. It looks delightful there. Absolutely. I'm just going past the stables at uh, Windsor Castle. Uh, you took a special interest in that, so I remember. <laughs> yeah. There's a letterbox just in that corner. You might not be able to see it, but it's actually painted blue. And it's the only one I've ever come across that was actually set up for, for airmail letters in uh, uh, the early uh, years of the century, or when aircraft came in, presumably. Of course, we are heading towards the Cambridge Gate, aren't we? And we met a very interesting character. Let's hope we see him, the yes. Gate. <laughs> interesting jobs these chaps have got. Cyril Dole, his name is. He was chatting to us for quite some time yesterday. He'd been working for 29 years. Uh, about nine years of those on, 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 on the gates there. And his cottage is just the other side. Yes, just a few yards away, but he said he's often late getting to work <laughs> yeah. in the morning. He's only got a few yards to travel. We'll see if we can spot him. They're just... Tremendous cheers. Yes, the, they're called coachmen, the chaps on the back of the, uh, on the back of the carriage. Now, they're going through the Cambridge gate, and I think Cyril's just off there on the right. He's normally only allowed to open the gate for, as he calls it, past, present and future, the Queen Mother, um, the Queen and Prince Charles. Not a, not a heavy duty, no, not I don't think. Not, I not, think not, that not a job. stressful job, no. And he's also moved some of the plants from outside his house to decorate his gate so it looks at its best on such a special day. It was a lovely touch. And this is the end of the long walk as it's gone into the grounds of uh, Windsor Castle. Going up to the George IV gate, that magnificent uh, frontal part of Windsor Castle. 
they're going to the reception. The guests behind me are now being taken up for the reception. A buffet, hot and cold, beef stroganoff is the hot, and kulibiak. Yes. Uh, away, for, away for the crowd. It is a buffet style, and they'll have a hot and a cold choice for the guests there. I think they're waving to castle attendants on the side <laughs> there who were allowed to stay there to watch them go by. Yes, there was some thought that uh, some, some royalty might not want to queue up for a buffet, but I'm told there are five serving areas, so presumably there won't be too much queuing involved. And then the band of uh, Her Majesty's uh, Royal Marines will provide some of the entertainment. Oh, yes, and the... The Blues Brothers. Yes. The Commitments and uh, 60s, 60s style. music, that's it. Which is pretty anyway, very this is, the, this is the last glimpse we'll get today of Sophie and Edward as they go to the George IV gate. To their reception. A sigh of relief, I think, as well as the <laughs> exultation as they go through the York and Lancaster gates uh, into the castle. And at that reception, we've also heard the cake that's being made there. It's going to have a theme of real tennis, which is obviously where they, uh, where they met on a real tennis court. This is the one that's made by upper crusts of, of Salisbury. Salisbury. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't make it up, could you? No, absolutely delightful. Yeah, and yeah. three toasts are going to be uh, made at the reception as well. That's right, that's right. Um, now, Prince Edward is making a toast. Can you remember who the toast are about? Yes, it's uh, the groom, the groom, the, no. the, the bride's father, yeah. and then... No, Edward will uh, do the toast for the Queen. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And then I think Prince Andrew and Prince Charles do so, a t toast yes. for the bridesmaids yes. and the page boys. Well, I wonder what the people, um, I wonder what the people in the town uh, actually made of it as, as they've just seen the bride and groom go by. Um, uh, Wesley Kerr is out there. Wesley, oh, what do they make of it? Oh, it's been absolutely fantastic. We didn't obviously see all the service, and we got so much of the atmosphere. Lots of people were monitoring it on radios. A few people had television sets. So there were bursts of applause, especially when they were married at the end of the service. People throwing confetti, and then we had the joy of seeing them. Now, you ladies have come from a long way. Where from? New Zealand. New Zealand. Yeah. Worth coming? Absolutely. Definitely. <laughs> How did you think the bride and the groom looked? Stunning. Absolutely stunning. What she looked lovely. Very elegant, yeah. You've come from Australia? Yeah, all the way from Australia. Just for this? Just for the wedding, yeah. yeah just okay. for the week. What was the highlight for you? Ah, oh, Sophie's just so stylish. She's gorgeous. She's gorgeous. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was really and just the coming. whole pomp and circumstance. You don't really get that in Australia. So. Yeah, I love it. So you won't be becoming a republic now then? <laughs> 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 okay, you're, I think you've come from, from Yorkshire. And um, worth it? Yeah. Oh, definitely worth it. I had a great day. Yeah. What was the highlight for you? Seeing them come down in the horse-drawn carriage without a doubt. And what, what, what would you say sums up the mood of the day? Um, I think people are quite exhilarated, very happy and excited. So worth spending a day on the streets for? Without a doubt. Yeah. Do Madam? Yes? I've come from New Orleans. And what did you think? I thought it was a lovely day, incredible. Well worth the wait, and the crowds have been wonderful. So maybe you'll have our royal family back. <laughs> <laughs> Madam, what did you think? It's been a wonderful day and such a pretty bride. Okay. And what was, what do you think of her outfit? Wonderful. Sir, you've got a beer celebrating already? Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, she's absolutely gorgeous. Beautiful. Okay, what do you think? Are you going to say hello to these people and say <laughs> we had a great time? <laughs> and you saw everything. Okay, thank you very much. From the streets where we've had a fantastic day, I'm afraid I applauded the bride and groom as well. Back to Michael. <laughs> well, back to Sue. Yeah, I think he did have a good day. Anyway, joining us now from the chapel is Trini Woodall, the uh, weekend fashion editor of The Telegraph. Now, we want to know your reaction to the dress. I thought it was so beautiful, and I thought it was the perfect dress for her. And mm. she looked, you know, nothing too fussy, but very, very feminine, lovely chiffon at the cuffs and the beading was delicate it was it was the best choice she could have made and the first reaction as well with the, the veil uh, here, here we see it now the veil is actually longer than the train and that added a, a nice touch as well well it makes it all sort of ethereal doesn't it and, and quite sort of it, it wasn't heavy at all you didn't feel this was a big whopping gra gown but something befitting a modern royal bride and as i said three hundred twenty-five thousand either beads or glass and I can beads imagine those ladies so at night long. sewing away Absolutely amazing. But the, the designer, as we've talked about, Samantha Short, that is her style. We saw her wedding dresser earlier in this programme, and I think she's absolutely captured Sophie. Yes, definitely. All her brides, I think, 
are very simple and let their natural beauty mm. show through. And I think that happened with Sophie too. She looked the most beautiful, I think, that how a bride should be on her wedding day. And we must talk also about Prince Edward. Yes, <laughs> and men always choice. left behind the wedding, don't they? He had yes. a, quite a smart waistcoat on, I noticed. Said with feeling there, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is the girls' day, I'm afraid. Mm. And as we talked about, the, the guests facing uh, the aisle, they've got such a, a, a fabulous view of, uh, of Sophie's dress and everything seemed to work. The jewellery, as we talked about, the necklace as a, as a present, it, it looked beautiful. It was yes, stunning. and nice to have something so personal too. And mm. the tiara, of course, I think borrowed from the Queen for the day, but that's very special. And of course we now realise why it was so much blue was in the flowers as well, because you can see Edward wearing a little bit of blue and, yes, and the and page the boys and the bridesmaids. Yes, quite surprising to have that dark colour, but I think it was very reminiscent of, of the nights, mm. you know, the nights here. We should have we should have known, shouldn't we? Yes. What, what did you make of the rest of what the rest of the royal family were wearing? I think I thought the Queen looked especially feminine today and you know, quite soft and a perfect mother. And all, you know, her sister and her mother, all the colours all seem to look well together. Um, the, the, the rest of the congregation, I think, was a big mixture. You know, everyone interpreted differently. It oh, wasn't um, easy, as we said, though, very at, difficult uh, to get it right. Yes, I think for easiest for people who are, funny enough, Muslim or from the Middle East, because for all weddings, they wear long like mm. that. So the South and Brunei's wives, you know, got it to a T in, mm. in a way, because they had on massive jewellery. You just <laughs> gagged at the jewellery. But, you know, the perfect length of dress and covered up, quite you know, demure. It's an awful thing to say, but were there any desperate fashion <laughs> mistakes that we... Um, oh, my goodness, I'd hate to, tastefully I'd hate to point, point fingers. Out. I mean, there were some extraordinary things. That lady with the hat, that was definitely a look-at-me statement. Um, but I think everyone tried to interpret as best they could, and you had a mixture of shawls and, and long dresses, all different length dresses. Mm. I thought it was an interesting good turnout, yes. And talking of fashion, I mean, I've got to mention my training shoes. I mean, I I'm, I'm, I'm only wearing them because like I have an injury. Out. I tap my Achilles tendon. I'm not supposed to be showing my feet. I think you mean the cool American look or something. <laughs> yes, yeah. very trendy, I think. Mm. But I must ask you about the bride's, uh, the bride's mother, Mary Reese yes, jones Yes, she looks fantastic. Designed and again by yes, Samantha Shaw. Very nice. It looked like a damas, sort of rusty mm. salmon but it was a great colour for her, mm. and I thought she looked very, very good, yeah. Mm. And what about the men? You made a, a, <laughs> a dismissive <laughs> remark about the men, but uh, Prince Charles in his grey... Uh, in his grey, uh, yes, in his, in his individual grey. I think men but don't But the Prince of Wales can't make a fashion error, presumably. I don't no. know if anyone can not make a fashion error, you know, <laughs> but I think that the more uh, important you are, the more people are maybe letting you get away with things. I mean, notice today so many sort of, well, capes or, or, or what would you call them, because obviously the, yeah, going I mean, from the church, going from the chapel to the... Yeah, there these sort of things, which are kind of very expensive cashmere, mm -hmm. and they come in very bright colours, so if you've got quite a mm -hmm. normal dress, you put it over. Here are some, some of the yeah. guests arriving. There really was a fierce wind, which, which certainly yes. played havoc with a few hairdos, I think. Yes, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't the day to have natural hair. <laughs> it did get caught in your eyes as you went in. There was some very grand hair as well, a lot of tiaras I noticed, which was quite surprising, befitting a state occasion. And um, I'm no expert on this, but Sue said there seemed to be a lot of pink. <laughs> a lot of pink. I it's think the it's, colour a, it's the for colour, summer, you know, like it? every season there's a different colour and definitely pink was in. Um, there are the South and Brunei's wives mm. looking very glamorous. <laughs> they got it right, she was saying. <laughs> well, they got it, for them, they got it perfect, yes. But it, it was a difficult thing, as we were talking about the, 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 the capes, because it, in the chapel it, it is one dress code in a way, and then at the reception yes, later on Yes, and I think quite different. a few people managed to have something over. Katrina Skepper, she had a sort mm. of bolero jacket over, and you know that later on when it gets, she's dancing, she can take it off and sort of feel that she's got a proper evening dress on, and that was a good solution for many people. And others just had a sort of long chiffon scarf. Like Helen Windsor had that on too. But the church just looked lovely as well with the Incredible flowers. Beautiful flowers, yeah. yes. I'm just staggering. I'm getting married September and I was thinking, oh my goodness, <laughs> I'll never be able to have that many flowers. Like, that's what I want now. Yeah. <laughs> Very beautiful. And I actually went in the chapel early and the smell was amazing. Yes, oh, a terrific yeah. smell of flowers. I mean, not just the natural flowers gr growing in the in the governor's garden there, but uh, even here, uh, but even, <laughs> no, well, even little, here, but in, yeah. especially yeah. in the chapel, mm, uh, extraordinary smell of uh, makes it flowers. all so much more romantic. I felt it was a very, very intimate romantic wedding compared to the other two. You know, you felt this That's was more what private wanted, occasion though, than a state occasion. Yes. They succeeded with having as a as a public royal wedding, but also having their own touches. Mm. Absolutely tremendous. Trini, thanks, thanks ever, thanks ever so much. There's still a. Uh, a wonderful buzz behind <laughs> as the people file out here.
And still a buzz in the town, I think, as well. Gosh, look how many people turned up. When they oh, said, uh, you know, that nobody would be interested in this <laughs> wedding, uh, I mean, just look at the people who've, who've turned up. And they turned up so early to see it, and, and all the shop windows all uh, depicting the wedding today and making their own special tribute. <laughs> 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 I wonder if he knows what it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> now there's the castle that uh, small hill where the round tower was the original place where William the Conqueror built his wooden uh, bailey on an artificial hill that which they called a mot somewhere in 1070 it was one of a chain of fortresses that William built around London about about a, a, a day's journey, a day's ride away from London. A fortress originally on a chalk hill, or ridge, uh, over the Thames. That's, that's the scene actually just behind us, the King Henry VIII gate, where people uh, leave the castle, where tourists leave the castle normally every day, and where now the, where now the people who got the tickets, the 6,000 odd tickets, and it was lovely watching early this morning when it came here with the early arrivals trying to get the best seats, <laughs> the best view with their Some cameras. Absolutely early, tremendous. Yeah. Windsor isn't great for traffic, it has to be said. <laughs> and I think anybody trying to leave Windsor at <laughs> this time tonight is in for a long time. Lovely. What? I'd quite like to see again, because I was talking to you a, a little bit uh, uh, during it, is uh, the key moment, I think, mm. of the wedding, the taking of the vows, the moment, in fact, where Sophie Rees-Jones uh, became the Countess of Wessex. Mm. I, Edward Anthony Richard Louis. I, Edward Anthony Richard Louis. Take thee, Sophie Helen. Take thee, Sophie Helen. To my wedded wife. To my wedded wife. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto. And thereto. I give thee my troth. I give thee my troth. I, Sophie Helen. I, Sophie Helen. Take thee, Edward Anthony Richard Louis. Take thee, Edward Anthony Richard Louis. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. Better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love, cherish, and to obey. To love, cherish, and obey. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto. And thereto. I give thee my troth. I give thee my troth. Bless, O Lord, this ring, which we hallow in thy name, that he who gives it and she who wears it may abide in thy peace, continue in thy favour, go on and grow old in thy love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. With this ring I thee wed. With this ring I thee wed. With my body I thee honour. With my body I thee honour. And all my worldly goods. And all my worldly goods. With thee I share. With thee I share. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Father. And of the Son. And of the Son. And of the Holy Ghost. And of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.
Oh, I was a bit worried there with the... Uh, with, did he have ring? the right one? <laughs> <laughs> but it was lovely. My favourite moment was when Edward first saw Sophie coming down the aisle and turned around and winked her. I thought that was, that was absolutely great. lovely. It, it Summed it lovely. all up. It was a lovely moment. So, the Queen has seen her youngest son married. For the guests, there's the reception in Windsor Castle. And we don't know when Edward and Sophie will leave or where they're going for their honeymoon. The papers were saying they'd be going at midnight, but we don't think that's right, do we, No, I hear that they're going to be staying here again tomorrow and, uh, and have a family day uh, here tomorrow. Oh, right. So uh, that'll be interesting. Probably leave sort of in the afternoon. And I hope that when they do go on their honeymoon, they probably go on a long one, because having been to Bagshot Park, their, their future home, which is only 11 miles away from here, the builders are in, and it doesn't look as though they're uh, quite on schedule at the moment. Well, you've so been I'm there. The, the, the renovations are supposed to be costing about £2 million. Oh, and it's, it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, it is huge, and, but the whole setting is lovely, set in 88 acres, and it's absolutely sensational. And uh, But it's, it does have a... A homely feel as well and I think they'll be very happy they're keen to get on with the garden <laughs> it's nice to know <laughs> yeah, it's Concord I think. <laughs> but the latest information we get actually why we've been actually been talking is that mm. they'll actually be leaving here by helicopter at half past two tomorrow afternoon but we don't know and I think it's They've right kept it that we don't know for us quite uh, exactly, a lot, they? There's exactly where probably a final been... twist in the tale <laughs> possibly <laughs> anyway for Edward and Sophie as with all newly married couples this is the start of a journey that everyone hopes will be long and happy and we wish them well from sue from me fiona and the bbc team here at windsor good evening bye